Okay, the next, the next speaker um, is Stephanie McMillan, and she creates, she creates the weekly editorial cartoon Code Green, which focuses on the environmental emergency and the daily syndicated comic strip Minimum Security. Uh, she has three books, a uh, cartoon collection plus two that uh, she and I have written together, As the World Burns, 50 Simple Things You Can Do to Stay in Denial, and uh, Mischief in the Forest. Um, and it's pretty funny, I've got to tell you the story, that uh, Mischief in the Forest is a, is a very nice, sweet children's story, and when we submitted that to the publisher who eventually took it, um, we had a phone call right after the, we submitted it, and um, he said, yeah, I really like it, um, but there's no guns. Um, they were kind of surprised. Um, it's for like five-year-olds. Um, we should do a children's book for five-year-olds that includes guns. She currently works with an anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist collective in South Florida called One Struggle. So this is Stephanie McMillan. What's with the gun? We're going to need that. <clears throat> we, we have an enemy, as, as Lear was explaining very well. It's the social, economic, political, and cultural system that's dominating and destroying the planet. We'll have to defeat it, and ultimately that does come down to the gun, a point to which I'll return. <clears throat> right now, our main weapon is information. Before we can defeat our enemy, we have to correctly identify it. We have to understand how it works, who controls it, its underlying structure, in order to pinpoint its vulnerabilities and work out effective strategies of intervention. I've been an activist since the early 1980s. All this time, a serious weakness of the environmental and social justice movements has been a lack of understanding of the nature of our enemy. Even in today's Occupy mobilizations, there's an overall reluctance to name the system that's dominating the planet. Instead, we hear vague populist terms like the 1%, the rich, banksters, and greedy corporations. Your work, Derek, has been an incredible breakthrough in exposing people to the idea that civilization is the foundation of the structures of domination. And what I'd like to do today is dig into the mechanisms of the current form of civilization, which is global capitalism. Many activists don't know how capitalism actually functions. We have to understand why it's structurally impossible to reform so that we can deal with the necessity and our responsibility to not to fix it because oppression is built into it from the start, but to do away with it and figure out all that will entail. We may in fact be the last generation with the opportunity to do this. I think that's really true. We are the last generation, clearly. And without digging under the surface to understand the system's true nature, it'll defeat us every time. So can you give examples of that? I experienced it not for the first time, unfortunately, last year with the BP oil spill. When the spill happened, I attended a spontaneous demonstration in front of a neighborhood BP station, holding a sign in the hot sun, which I got tired of in about five minutes. I've done my time holding signs on sidewalks and it didn't accomplish anything before, and it wasn't accomplishing, accomplishing anything this time either. BP was still setting oil-covered turtles on fire and spraying Corex into the water. Um, and of course, even now, um, dolphins are washing up onto the beaches at four to five times the normal rate. It's a continuing atrocity. So I decided to strategize with a few local activists to come up with something more effective. We called for an open meeting to form a coalition to shut down BP and stop offshore oil drilling, and we publicized that. It seemed like a common sense approach, but actually it was a mistake. The system has many methods of dealing with dissent. One is open repression, but before they resort to that, they try everything else, including co-opting it. They draw it into the dead ends it creates for this purpose. 
pressuring public officials, working with corporate and state-funded nonprofits, exercising formal civil rights such as free speech. As long as we don't threaten the actual relationship of power, we have all these means of dissent that we're permitted to exercise. And because the system has ideological hegemony, in other words, brainwashing, most people can't conceptualize resistance outside the framework allowed by the system itself. Spontaneously, they follow the paths that have been laid out for them. So the first meeting had 50 people, which initially I thought was really great. About 10% was a variety of radicals. The rest were either, either longtime liberal activists or those who had never done anything political before, but they were just outraged about the oil spill. Here's a radical response. Gathering the heads of the top executives of the major oil companies and use them to plug the hole. <laughs> it seemed like a viable ratio of liberals to radicals to me. I figured that the radicals could function as one trend within a large, diverse range. The problem was we hadn't organized going into it. We didn't know each other very well, and, and we didn't have a plan. So what ended up happening was that the radical approaches were ignored in favor of responses that the majority believed were open to them, to protest at a congressperson's office, to help a liberal commissioner get elected, to invite institutional environmental groups for yet another protest on the sidewalk with signs reading, Clean Energy Now, and to present public talks by green businesses. This is the typical liber liberal trajectory. First, we demand 350 parts per million. Eventually, we end up, please don't turn the planet into Venus. One radical immediately saw where this was going and walked out in the middle of the first meeting. By the third or fourth meeting, all the rest were gone. I stuck it out a bit longer. The collective demand shifted from stopping BP and all offshore drilling to one that was more considered more realistic for safer valves on oil rigs. Finally, the group adopted the name Clean Energy Coalition and the group decided to plant a tree at a church. <laughs> There's absolutely nothing wrong with planting a tree at a church. It's a very nice thing to do. I admire it. But it does not stop BP much less challenge the system that allows an entity like BP to destroy the planet. So I learned several lessons from this. One, in society overall, and thus in any open gathering, the default majority doesn't grasp the system's unreformable structure or identify it as an enemy. Thus, they will not oppose it in any fundamental sense. So liberal and reformist ideas will tend to overwhelm the more radical ones, like this. Second lesson, individual radicals have little power. We need to be organized autonomously to exert collective influence within larger formations, like this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the third lesson, there's an essential difference between mobilizations and movement building. Mobilizations aren't that difficult. When some new outrage occurs, you issue a call and a bunch of angry people might come out. They don't have to agree on that much, but when they go home again, we end up with nothing. So we need organizations resilient enough to withstand the inevitable ebbs and flows of mass struggles. Okay, so after the whole tree planting thing, what did you do? I connected with other local radicals, some of whom were the ones who had walked out of that original meeting, and we formed a collective called One Struggle. Now we can assert a radical presence when working with other groups and coalitions. Last month, we even worked with the Clean Energy Coalition and other groups to hold a rally, during which, during which we distributed our own materials. So we can organize independently within other mobilizations, such as the Occupy Upsurge, and grow stronger even if that dissipates. Okay. Um, let's go back to global capitalism, and can you define it, please? It's an economic system characterized by a commodity production and private appropriation in which one section of people monopolizes the means of subsistence, while the others are forced to sell their labor power to survive. Not everyone enjoys this arrangement. Economic class divisions emerged about 10,000 years ago, roughly in tandem with agriculture. From the beginning, class-divided economies, which I see as roughly corresponding to civilization itself, have been organized around the private appropriation of so-called surplus wealth, 
accomplished through the production of storable, exchangeable goods, like salt, coffee, iPads, cars, grains, and so on. The flow of commodities from earth to assembly line to landfill is the basis of, and is represented by, the circulation and accumulation of a very abstract form of wealth, which is money. Capitalism is, on the one hand, a social relation, whereby one economic class, a small minority, the ruling class, dominates all others. On the other hand, it's a process, the endless flow of money to commodity production to the generation of more money. But it's not linear. It's both cyclical and progressive, like a spiral. Here's a very simple rep representation of the process and its major nodal points. <laughs> you got that? I'm kidding, it's actually way more complicated. <laughs> so here's an extremely simplified and necessarily incomplete representation of capitalism's basic structure. Since it's a cycle, the original vicious cycle, we can start at any point. So let's start with M, money. A bank or a queen or anyone who already has surplus wealth extends a line of credit to some explorer to gather a group, to gather a group of armed thugs go out into the world, locate wealth, and steal it. The first part of the process... <laughs> the first part of the process is primary accumulation, where land is expropriated and resources are extracted. The expropriation of land does a few things. The conqueror can use that land and extract whatever is in it and on it. And as the people are dispossessed, no longer able to live on the land, they're forced into labor camps. These are commonly known as cities. They become dependent on jobs. <laughs> this is how the working class is created and continuously resupplied. It also creates the consumer. Without land, we have to pay for food, shelter, and all our other needs. The next part is production. One of the defining features of capitalism is the exploitation of labor. Exploitation has a precise meaning in economics which isn't simply using somebody heartlessly for material gain. It means that the worker is paid less than the exchange value of what they produce. So during the time that they're paid $10, they might make items that can be sold for $100. That extra $90 minus the fixed costs is surplus value that the capitalist privately appropriates. And that's another word for stealing. Externalization of costs is another way that the capitalists commit theft and murder as well. Pollution from the production process is discharged into the environment. The numerous and serious consequences, never mind the cleanup which never happens, are not paid for by the capitalists who cause the problem, but by society as a whole and by every li living being as well. I would like to point out about the externalization that researchers um, say that about 40% of all human deaths, that's 23 million per year, 63,000 per day, are caused by water, oil, air, and soil pollution. And I just want to point out that we hear constantly, when was the last time you heard a politician give a speech in which they did not mention 9-11? And there were about 3,000 people died. And that means that there are um, 21 9-11s uh, every day from pollution. Um, but of course, we never hear about that. Can you cite that statistic, please? Um, it's researchers from Cornell University, and it's actually cited in the book Deep Green Resistance. I don't. I could make up a citation for you. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's in Deep Green Resistance, somewhere in between pages 1 and 630. <laughs> and if that's the numbers for humans, I mean, I'm sure that's likely true of all creatures. Other capitalists are running the same cycle. All their commodities flow into the marketplace. Competition is the major economic driving force of capitalism. Capitalists compete against each other for the sale by outmarketing each other or by undercutting each other in price, and usually both. This puts pressure on the rate of profit to fall. To remain competitive, the capitalists are forced to cut costs, especially wages, the largest variable cost in most businesses, and they're forced to escalate productivity, which drives technological development in search of efficient efficiency and speed. Smaller companies that can't keep up are driven out of business or bought up by the larger ones, forming monopolies in certain sectors. Four companies controlled 90% of the world's grain production. Only 10 to 12 produce most semiconductors. 
10 produce most pharmaceuticals. These monopolies can control prices to counteract the falling rate of profit. So while the local hardware store is failing, large oil companies are making more money than ever. That reminds me actually of a quote by, I love this quote, by uh, Dwayne Andreas, uh, former CEO of Archer Daniels Midland. Um, he said, there's not one grain of anything in the world that's sold in the free market. The free market exists only in the speeches of politicians. Um, it's all monopoly capital. Yeah. The surplus value or profit created in production is locked inside the commodity until the moment of consumption. This is the big moment for the capitalist. When you plunk your dollars down to buy the hair dryer or the box of frozen waffles, the capitalist goal is realized. Now we run into the, to capitalism's major contradiction. Because the workers are collectively paid less than the total worth of commodities that they produce, there will always be more on the market than what can be consumed by the domestic population. This causes what's caused, called the crisis of overproduction. There's too much stuff, and because product, the profit is created by exploiting labor, the people in aggregate will never, and they can never, be paid enough to buy all that they produce. The system can't absorb all the extra surplus value, so what do they do with it? They can't just leave it lying around to depreciate. They have to get rid of it somehow. A portion is siphoned off for personal use by capitalists to furnish extravagant lifestyles with excessive salaries and bonuses. They must force open more, more markets, one of the driving forces for imperialism. Some is simply thrown away, eliminated through waste, wars, and so-called international aid. The latter two also func function as centers for creating even more profit, which they pursue, but which also exacerbates the overall problem. Stephanie, can you just, I think this is a really important point. Can you, so basically, like you said earlier, that the, if a worker makes $100 worth of something, they can only buy $10 because that's their wages. So, so the other extra stuff. What do they do with it? They have to open markets. They, that's why they force the world to open up. They and make these deals like NAFTA and so on. And this is one reason for also the huge military budgets, because this way nobody has to buy it. Because you, we you buy it another way through our taxes. And then they simply build it, and then it gets blown up. So mm -hmm. you actually don't have consumer, nobody purchases a bomb. Right, yeah, it's the extra stuff has gotten rid of conveniently, and so then also while conquering more land to get the resources to make more stuff. So it's like dual use. Yes. <laughs> Multitasking. It's very efficient. They've got it figured out. They increase the level of consumption with infusions of credit. This is another way that they solve that problem. They base the consumer economy on debt. Of course, this creates bubbles and instability, which grow progressively worse. Back at the start, surplus value has to be reinvested. It must be more than they started with, because only through expansion can each company gain a competitive edge over all the others. For capitalism to function, it must grow about 3% annually. So the cycle goes around, but bigger. In the next turn, they must extract more raw materials, exploit more labor, manufacture more products, generate more waste and make more profits. This is not easy. As economies become saturated, there's less opportunity for profitable investment. So they have to invent ways to turn more things into commodities, invading us through privatization and monetizing every aspect of our lives from our emotions to our genetic material. As we know, you can't have infinite growth on a finite planet. I know I've learned that from you. Today, the crisis You're obviously of not an economist. <laughs> right, obviously. They don't think so. Today, the crisis of overproduction has become acute, and the system is maxed out. It's reached the end of all physical limits. Last year, David Bianco, the head of the U.S. equity strategy of, at Bank of America, said cash is piling up faster than companies know what to do with it. You know, that's actually a problem I've had for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> you have my deepest sympathy, and so do they. <laughs> U.S. corporations are sitting on $1.6 trillion in cash. Apple alone has $76.4 billion, a larger amount than the U.S. government has in reserve. They're desperate to invest it, but there's nowhere profitable to put it. Tycoons like Warren Buffett and Bill Gates are begging to be taxed, and they're giving away billions of dollars. 
Of course, philanthropy generates profits too, so the system ends up further saturated. The machine is grinding to a halt. Great, so what are we doing here? Do you want to just end on its own? <laughs> Let's partay. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not going to end on its own soon enough. Capitalism in crisis becomes even more ruthless, as we see with extreme extraction, like oil from tar sands and fracking for natural gas. They no longer even bother to keep up the pretense of caring about the future. You know, that's one of the things, a joke I used to tell for years is, who's the idiot who made up the idea of putting poison on our own food in terms of pesticide? But it's not even a joke anymore, because who's the idiot who came up with the idea of putting poison in their own groundwater? It just makes no fucking sense. It makes no sense in terms of life. It makes sense only in terms of making money. Oh, well, no. that's okay then. Yeah. <laughs> More toilet paper for us. <laughs> Capitalism will ultimately destroy itself, but only when it's destroyed all life on the planet, which is too late to matter. Until then, capitalism is all about breaking through limitations. That's what it always does. But how can I expand through physical limitations? Increasingly, capitalists are busting through the overproduction problem by bypassing the production process altogether. Instead, they use money to make more money through interest on credit, speculation, and arbitrage. This seems to throw production along with workers and consumers out of the equation. Though commodity production is still the largest part of the global economy, it's declining in the United States. In the early 1970s, the U.S. produced 38% of the world's commodities. Today, it's only 9%. Six million manufacturing jobs have vanished since the year 2000. In contrast, finance capitalism is on the rise. In 1978, 2% of global profit came from finance. Today it's 42 percent. So its influence on the economy is considerable and it's destabilizing, but producing more commodities is destabilizing too. So the crisis shifts from place to place with no long-term workable options. This escape from production is partial and temporary and will inevitably crash because the money is not based on real things. It's fake surplus value, gambling basically, on bad debt and toxic assets. There's nothing underpinning it. Financial collapse has happened many times before and it will happen again. It'll cause chaos and shakeups and major business interests will fail. On the negative side will be increased suffering for the majority of people who were trapped in the economy. Plus, we may see the rise of fascism and the conflict between industrial and financial sectors may break out into civil war. But for the ruling class as a whole, this will bring a certain salvation, an opportunity for the system to restructure itself. There will be an economic lurch downward to reset to a level that will spark a new round of the accumulation process, once again based on the production of material commodities that re contain real surplus value. You know, th there's a discussion that you and I have had about 50 times about the whole notion of surplus value and how the capitalists have to spend the money on blowing things up. And one of the things I've said to you a lot and you have disagreed with is that, well, why can't they, since the whole economic system is based on subsidy anyway, I mean, once again, capitalism is, I mean, free markets have, doesn't exist. It's all, all based on subsidies. The, the world, the commercial fishing fleets around the world are actually subsidized to a degree greater than the actual value of their catch, which means we'd all be better off if they were just paid to stay home in their underpants and watch the prices right. And it's the same with timber, it's the same with all these different uh, economic, with all these different corporations, all these different economic sectors, that they're subsidized to a value greater than the actual value of the stuff they make. So one of the things I've been promoting for 20 years um, is that why don't, if, if this culture were sane, they would just change the subsidies. And so instead of paying warehouser to deforest, you pay warehouser to reforest, or paying I don't know what the major fishing companies are, but instead of paying Gorton's fish sticks to deforest, you, you, they simply pay them to, to do nice things. <laughs> and I mean, obviously there's psychological problems with that because those empower murderous, murderous sociopaths. But I mean, setting aside the sociopathology, you've also said structurally why my idea doesn't work. And I've never really understood. So can you, maybe you can explain it to them and they can explain it to me. I hope I can explain it. Um, it is, um, it's a thorny 
question because it doesn't make sense really rationally and that's that's what capitalism is it's really irrational um, they can cooperate to a certain degree and they do but capitalism capital has a motion of its own beyond the interests of individual capitalists and beyond rationality competition is the primary mechanism of the economy and that's the reason it can't be reformed even to save themselves they um, it's not based on what's good or rational it's based on what makes money at that moment and the individuals can't decide on their own that they're going to change that system because they're competing among each other it's like this look at the devastation there's almost nothing left I'm counting on you to squeeze the last bits of profit out of it this is their approach they have to go after the most accessible profits no matter how irrationally they're obtained and regardless of their personal desires they can't care whether what they're produced is good or or useful for destroying the environment to maximize profits executives get promoted for changing their policies out of concern for the environment and making less profit they would be replaced massive unemployment isn't really a problem for the ruling class if they created more jobs the problem of overproduction would actually get worse high unemployment and cuts in social programs actually work out quite nicely for them because soon we're going to be screaming for jobs and willing to accept any pathetic wage like this woman here when the economy is good she has one reaction when the economy is bad she has a completely opposite reaction please don't fire me massive unemployment really oh I've already done that sorry <laughs> um, factoring in the cost of transportation transporting goods the wages of workers in China and the US are reaching parity when that happens we'll see a resurgence of domestic production here but reset at a lower level these won't be union jobs allowing decent living conditions and forget about health care watch for the elimination of the minimum wage they'll say we're very sorry it's only a temporary measure for your sake to bring jobs back to the US wait can you say that again we're very sorry it's only a temporary measure for your sake to bring jobs back to the US I think she's running for presidential nomination for the Republican Party <laughs> no I said we're very sorry that means I'm working for Obama <laughs> that's in store for us whether or not the cheap oil runs out they don't care where they get their energy it could be coal natural gas from fracking oil from tar sands in the deep oceans biofuels solar wind algae even slave labor they don't care about the sources um, as long as they control it all the system is dynamic adaptable and infinitely ruthless it will not collapse by itself there's no need there's no escape from our need to destroy it so why do people up with, put up with a whole nightmare? Because of the superstructure, the ideas and institutions that we can picture as a shell around the economic structure, both supporting it and shaped by its needs. The sole purpose of the state is to keep the flow of capital running smoothly. It administers and regulates the process with its government and legal system. It enforces it with its military, police, prison complex, and security apparatus. The culture also serves capitalist interests. The only ideas allowed to participate in the market are pro system. Any others are starved of support. The which, which is one reason that, the, that I said earlier that the, all of the so called solutions to global warming take industrial capitalism as a given. Mm -hmm. Because if they don't, then they. Who they, would fund them? Well, that's a problem. And who would buy that? You know, if, if you try to sell that idea to a publisher, it's, um, it's a much harder sell than to say that we have an easy answer that everyone's comfortable with wait that's actually a really good idea for a book I can <laughs> easy solutions 50 Anthony, simple Anthony's my things agent. that we can do to save the planet 50 simple things we can do to save the planet Anthony can we talk to like Harper Collins okay <laughs> let's let's uh, get in, get in touch with them early next week I'm spending the money already. Oh, I've already got more You've cash. You've already than got I can more do. than you can do. <laughs> Forget it. The dominant culture tells us how to think and behave through its stories, the stories and myths of the mainstream media, entertainment, and religion. 
It indoctrinates us in its schools. Its traditions train us in habits of obedience to authority and individualism. Its ideologies reinforce structural oppression, such as misogyny, racism, homophobia, and xenophobia. The nuclear family is a self-policing social unit enforcing the domination of children and women. We need to break So you aren't running for Republican. Uh, <laughs> we need to break through the superstructure to choke off the flow of capital, like this. So how? How do we choke it off? There are so many possibilities. Because we don't know until they happen which contradictions or, or crises will create revolutionary openings, we have to be prepared to intervene everywhere. Significant attention must be focused at the economic nodal points because a revolutionary movement must be able to damage, weaken, and ultimately halt capital's flow. Of primary importance right now is helping people understand why the system needs to be taken down and how their various social and political struggles are connected at this foundational point. It's so crucial because the system has numerous methods of assimilating our struggles and we have to make sure we don't get sidetracked. It diverts discontent into forms that reinforce its own institutions. They're very sophisticated and persuasive. They make people feel that they're making a difference when in fact they're tightening the bonds of their own oppression. <laughs> Elections, corporate funded nonprofits, NGOs and CBOs, pers personal change, political pressure, culture jamming, tinkering with the economy, green jobs and withdrawing our support, symbolic protests, all are offered up as options of dissent. None of them are sufficient. On the contrary, they serve to reinforce the system's authority and the illusion of democracy. These approaches have traction because most people don't grasp how the system actually works and that it's structurally unreformable. They don't recognize it as the absolute enemy that it is. What's missing in our movement is the understanding that if we're to radically transform social relations and the way we meet our needs as a society, then we need to rupture the economic cycle. We have to dispossess the dispossessors and take back our means of subsistence. Um, if we do that, won't they kill us? <laughs> they will try. And this is where the gun comes in. You remember the first slide. A revolutionary movement is going to have to fight and defeat their armed forces and overthrow their state in order to break the shell to get to the economic core. Waging a revolution means going to war with the capitalist class. I mean that in the most difficult and challenging sense. Not a PR war, not a war for hearts and minds, but a war for power. As long as they possess the power to expropriate and exploit, they will not stop. There's no avoiding it. The blood of our people all over the world is already spilled daily as a part of the ordinary workings of capitalism. Our sisters and brothers are fighting and dying in struggle against the same enemy, and our expressions of solidarity mean nothing unless we're striving as hard as we can to build our capacity so that we can one day, as soon as possible, fight alongside them. Years ago, I interviewed a member of the Tupac Amaristas, MRTA, a rebel, a rebel group in Peru, and um, I sent a query to the nation asking if they would be interested in running the interview. And I got a call from the editor saying that, yeah, that'd be great. Um, so we're really excited about this. What's the interview going to be about? And I said, well, it's about their struggle there and about the importance of the way, the, the best way we can support a struggle for people in the colonies is to actually bring the struggle home and, um, and bring down capitalism here. Hello? Hello? <laughs> and the editor said, her, she lost all enthusiasm and said, I, I'll get back to you. Um, we need to actually discuss it. This is an editorial. And about 20 minutes later, I got an email saying, sounds like a really good idea, but really, we've got to think about it. Um, so as long as it was brown people somewhere else who were struggling against capitalism, it was a wonderful idea. But as soon as I talked about bringing it home, they were not so interested. Right. As long as it's far away or far back in history, then, then it's okay. But not here, not now. John Brown's my hero, you know. Yeah, it was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so obviously and sadly, we're not in a position to do this yet. A people's army without a strong mass movement to back it up is a suicide squad and can't possibly win. 
People have tried that already. So let's not waste the hard-won experience of the Red Army Faction or the George Jackson Brigade. Today, our task is to increase our capacity, to build the organizations that together can be powerful enough to overcome the capitalists' accumulated forces of lies, wealth, and arms. So what sort of organizations are you talking about? And how, how would one build them? Here's what my comic strip character, Benista, says about that. We must build a broad, diverse, multi-level, multifaceted, multi-class, anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist liberation movement with a core focused on forcibly stopping ecocide and exploitation, led by an alliance of revolutionary autonomous organizations of the international class conscious proletariat and anti-colonial indigenous and other land-based peoples. <laughs> While we're at it, Maybe we should build a rainbow ladder to reach marshmallow clouds and marmalade skies. And indeed, it's not going to be easy. We can't conjure this movement out of thin air. And it won't be exactly what we want or we think we need. It will emerge from our current reality, flawed, chaotic, and largely unpredictable. It's not going to follow any formula, but we're not flying completely blind either. We, worldwide, we have a rich history of resistance and revolutionary theory to draw from. Because of the particular history and culture of the US, we can't expect, at least in the initial stages, to be able to build one coherent movement that unites everyone. No single particular grouping is going to have sufficient theoretical understanding, mass support, and combative strength. But when we look at all the diverse forces in aggregate, the picture changes. Some combination of the various forces that are gelling into a resistance movement may be able to su succeed. Let's look at some of the issues where struggle is occurring now. <clears throat> the shades represent different levels of consciousness within each struggle. Revolutionaries understand the need to defeat those in power. Radicals understand the need to end the system. Reformers work for change within the context of the system. While each struggle and level is incomplete on its own, each can contribute to its overall success. Like members of an ecosystem, each builds an essential niche. These trends must find ways to ally and cohere in a multifaceted movement, where each part retains its autonomy, but together are able to coordinate activities or at least offer mutual support. At the outer ring are reformers and liberals. This is where institutional unions, NGOs, politicians, the Democratic Party, and so on, glom onto the movement to suck the life out of it. <laughs> channeling activists into pointless and energy draining losing strategies, which is their function. At the same time, a lot of people are located, who are located there sincerely want change. We should encourage and assist com combative mass organizations to fight for reforms that weaken capital without sinking into reformism, an ideology that accepts the terms set by the ruling class. We should also strive to radicalize those we can and the continuing atrocities committed by the system will help with that more than anything, and provide alternatives to participate in. As for the liberals who can't be radicalized, when they're inevitably forced to take sides, we must insist upon their neutrality at the very least. Some will be tempted to betray the revolution in, the, in favor of the devil they know. We can't ignore them. If we don't attempt to win as many possible over, fascists will do it. Radicals can build a movement within a movement that establishes as a minimum point of unity that our common enemy is the system, whether we call it civilization, colonialism, imperialism, or global capitalism, and encourages and challenges others to deal with that reality. When broad sections of people are in motion, revolutionary organizations can also begin to congeal. At the core are those who understand that this is a war for power and who can develop corresponding strategies. We should focus our energy on the center two rings. The stronger their magnetic pull, the more they can draw others in pr from the periphery. To add more weight there, we should work as close to the center as we can get. For example, as a cartoonist, I could organize with other cartoonists around free speech issues, but this is in the outer zone of reform. There's nothing wrong with fighting for reforms, but it's better to devote our energy to strengthening the center areas. So who would, who would comprise the leading revolutionary core? The sections of people capable of leading the revolutionary process internationally are collective, 
or subsistence land-based cultures resisting colonialization and dispossession and those whose labor is exploited. Workers have been dispossessed of their original means of subsistence and are forced to sell their labor to the capitalists to survive. For most of us, this happened so many generations ago that we no longer remember it. Indigenous societies either haven't had this happen to them yet or they still remember that it did, or it's happening to them right now. All of the dominated popular classes must wage struggle against our common enemy, but for the revolution to achieve total liberation, it must be carried out under the leadership of the expropriated and exploited. These two groups are strategically located where life is converted to surplus value. Capitalism cannot continue to function if they're stopped from extracting resources or if laborers refuse to work. The interests of indigenous communities and the most exploited workers are diametrically opposed to capitalism. They come face to face with its most vicious forms and their self-preservation depends on ending it. Plus, they can only, only they can lead society to a sustainable and classless way of life. Others will inevitably stop short. So where does saving the planet fit into all this? The conversion of nature into commodities is intertwined with the exploitation of labor. One can't happen without the other. Similarly, the fight to defend the land and traditional land-based ways of life is also connected to the fight for an end to exploitation, a classless society. One can't be achieved without the other. When we understand this, liberating ourselves and saving the planet become the same act. Wait, before we go on, I want to ask, all those people, all those people are protesting against pollution emitted by a solar panel factory, but why do those people hate the environment? I can't answer that one. <laughs> Because solar panels are the solution. Oh, yeah. We should tell them. Yeah, if we just, if we just tell them, if we make them understand. <laughs> okay, so what about the fact that the environment and jobs are often viewed as conflicting? I mean, I know that um, a lot of unions have come out in favor of Keystone, and, you know, God knows as a forest activist, we've had to fight unions a lot. Um, even, when, even, when the, the tim even when they know that the timber company is going to just, as soon as they cut, they're going to leave anyway, they still have op opposed us. No one would sell their labor, go willingly into a mine, factory, or cubicle day after day if they still had the means to live otherwise. But capital has been very good at dividing the interests of the workers from the environment. This is, of course, intentional. After the Gulf oil spill, workers demanded that oil rigs open back up because they needed the jobs to survive. Yet these are the very same people being poisoned by the externalization of costs. Wait, there's, I remember reading, um, sorry, I remember uh, reading uh, some language by a pro-slavery philosopher, a letter to his abolitionist capitalist buddy back in the 1830s, and he was saying, if we could arrange land ownership conditions like you have up in the north, we would give up the slaves immediately because there's land ownership conditions in which it's in the capitalist's best interest to own slaves or not own them. And it's really simple. If there's a lot of land and not many people, then people have access to land, which means they have access to food, clothing, and shelter, which means they have access to self-sufficiency, which means there's the only way you can get them to work for you is the point of a gun. If, on the other hand, you have a lot of people and not much land, then they don't have access to land, which means they don't have access to food, clothing, and shelter, which means they don't have access to self-sufficiency, which means they have to go to work for you for whatever pittance. And it's actually cheaper from the capitalist perspective, in that case, not to own them. So that's just, that's just a pro-slavery philosopher making the exact point you were just making. Mm -hmm. Here I want to show um, the classic worker's dilemma. This is the bind that workers have been placed in. You have a choice, a job that will feed your kids for three years, building something that will kill them later, or starve now. This bind can only be resolved by the overthrow of capitalism and taking back our means of subsistence. We don't need jobs at all. In fact, that just helps the capitalist. What we need is a sustainable, sustainable way of life. Oh, that's one more thing. I got, had a, a debate with a, with a green capitalist, and one of the things he said was, okay, let's say that both of us go into the colonies, and um, he didn't use that word, though, um, and if you have the best critique ever of capitalism, and I will offer them a job um, producing something for the global elite, which is not language he used either, um, then which of us will make more friends? And 
my response was, A, the struggle is actually not based on making friends, and B, um, let's change it so that one person goes in to offer them a job servicing the global elite, and the other person goes in with material support to help them reclaim their land, um, which one is going to have more friends? That's a great point. Yeah. Two, two ideological elements are essential at the revolutionary core, biocentrism and class consciousness. Not everyone will start out with a full appreciation of both of these, but even if revolutionaries themselves don't yet realize it, these ideologies represent allied and complementary movements in a strategic sense. Each has its own strengths and weaknesses. Each has gaps that are filled in by the other. They have different strategies, but each will have better chances for success the more they cooperate. The major flaw of the class struggle has been anthropocentrism, a total focus on human needs and an, a utilitarian view of nature. The major flaw of environmentalists, and frankly the labor movement as well, which has mostly been co-opted by sold out unions, has been a lack of cl class analysis and understanding of capitalism as a system that we need to defeat. Instead, many fall victim to illusions of reformism, bourgeois democracy, technotopianism, lifestyleism, and other bogus schemes. Like these people. <laughs> As the revolutionary project gains common experience, these movements will cross-pollinate, come closer together in their struggles against their common enemy. It's the job of revolutionaries to foster unity between them and the development of alliances. As the economic and environmental crises converge, a mutual learning process in both directions is already beginning to occur. Defenders of labor and land are coming to grips with the gaps in their respective approaches and are reaching out toward one another. Environmentalists are analyzing the underlying mechanisms that drive the system connecting the fight to save the planet with social transformation and beginning to build organizations capable of mass resistance. Communists and socialists are recognizing that the environmental crisis must be urgently addressed or there won't be a future at all. We see this cross-pollination spreading around the world. So what should we do now to build this revolutionary movement? We should build consciousness, organization, and struggle in a mutually reinforcing and escalating cyclical way. First, revolutionary consciousness is foundational. Before it can happen in real life, revolution must first happen in the mind. So that's what a lot of indigenous people have said to me too, that the first thing that we have to do is to decolonize our minds. That's exactly right. I agree. Theory and ideological unity develop alongside reality itself. Instead of dogmas and formulas, we need creativity and experimentation. Second, we need to construct various forms of self-replicating, autonomous, yet interconnected organizations. These ought to prefigure, as much as possible, a future sustainable and egalitarian society. Within our strategic alliances, diversity is our strength, and we must be mutually supportive and set aside secondary conflicts and contradictions. That's the horizontal hostility Lier was talking about. We have to maintain principled unity, even with people we don't particularly like. Shit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I know, it's hard. <laughs> That's the hardest part. Yeah, Third, forget fighting the capitalists. Fighting I just have that. to get along with those other assholes. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Third, we need to engage in struggle. Knowledge doesn't come from teach-ins or study groups alone. We can't learn how to paint or pay, play the guitar without practice, and the same is true of waging revolution. We must take every opportunity to exercise our power against capital and its state apparatus to the maximum extent possible at any, any given moment while preserving our movement with escalating intensity until we're strong enough to overcome the capitalist accumulated forces of lies, wealth, and arms so that we can finally dismantle the system altogether and create an alternative. There is a revolution struggling to come into being. It can only happen if we take responsibility for embodying it, by giving it form, by becoming ourselves revolutionary militants. Liberation is possible, and more to the point necessary for the survival and well-being of all life on Earth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.